very thankful to have each and every one of you here today. The weather was a little bit challenging, as you know. Uh, many are, are watching us online, and so I want to welcome all of you as well. Hope you've come praying that the Lord will be with us as we enter into his worship service. We're here to praise and honor and extol and uh, magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to open services by reading to you from the third chapter of Psalms, the third division of Psalms. This is Psalms 3. This is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. It's a good psalm, isn't it? It's good at any time. It's particularly good today. Well, I have a few announcements that I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, let everybody know and, and uh, say that this is the fourth Sunday weekend. Our new arrangement is to have Elder Mark Wattenbarger come and preach for us, so he'll be taking the time this morning after prayer. Uh, we're very glad to have you and everyone who is here visiting with us. Uh, I do apologize for the lunar moon surface kind of parking lot that we had to drive on. It was very bumpy. Uh, probably by about mid-afternoon, most of that will be slushed and, and gone. But uh, I am thankful for each one of you who have been able to come and weather the storm. Well, good morning to everyone, good morning. to everyone here and to everyone there, uh, good morning, and uh, I hope that you have come praying that the Lord will continue to, to bless us and grant us grace as we look into his word one more time, so we might gain comfort and grow in wisdom and in understanding. If you have your Bibles and you care to turn to the book of Ezekiel, and before you groan and go, oh no, here we go again. I'll start by saying this. Brother Randy can correct me, Brother Alan too, if, if I've got this wrong. But I have the secret decoder ring for prophecy in the Bible. It is all about fulfilling God's covenant through the work of Jesus Christ, the Savior of His people. If we keep that in mind when we're reading Scripture, a lot of what's really, really hard can be opened. Now, I am not claiming in any way that I have a complete and full understanding of every single prophecy throughout the Old and New Testament. I don't know that any man does, except the man Jesus Christ, who wrote it. But, it's not as difficult as we often try to make it. As I said recently, sometimes when we say, uh, well, the Bible's too hard to understand. What we're really saying, if we dig down into it, is I don't want to hear what God has to tell me, so I'm going to claim it's too hard to understand. That way I don't have to do it. The book of Ezekiel. There's a lot of prophecy in here about the coming destruction of Israel and Judah. Uh, there's a lot of prophecy in here about times which are to come. God revealed to the prophet what was coming. We're going to read a little bit about that today, Lord willing. Some of it in the book of Ezekiel, as in other places in the um, books of prophecy in the Old Testament, is a little uh, challenging for us to get our minds around. That's why I started with, 
kind of our, our overlay for prophecy, if we understand that the purpose for all of this is for God to teach his people and reveal to us how he is accomplishing his, the fulfillment of his covenant through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, it kind of unlocks some things for us. So the book of Ezekiel was written by a prophet who was captive around 597 B.C. So he was captured out of Judah and, and out of Jerusalem. He was taken with the captives to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. The, uh, the other prophets that were prophesying around the same time, before and during, Jeremiah and Zechariah, they all kind of had one focus, one purpose. Uh, and much of it had to do with concerns about the priesthood and priestly things. So the glory of God, the duties of the priests, and the present temple and the future temple, the one that was to come, the one in which the Lord would walk through and inhabit. So when we look at the book of Ezekiel, uh, we are reading about God's prophecy concerning his Christ, concerning the Messiah, and how God revealed to Ezekiel what the Christ would do and how he would accomplish those things. So if we turn, in particular, I want to turn to the 34th chapter. So this is Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, to me, speaks of the, the great shepherd that is to come. A lot of these words will sound familiar. I think we can spend most of our time in Ezekiel chapter 34, but there should come to mind other scriptures, other prophecies, but in particular other scriptures as we read through this, because a lot of the language is going to be very similar. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. So this is a pronouncement, once again, of the Lord God, Jehovah, the head of his kingdom against the shepherds whom he had set in charge over his flock. God had established a, uh, a means by which his people would be fed and protected. He established that his shepherds, his priests, would have the, bear the responsibility and the duty of feeding the flock, which is to say, serving on behalf of the people in God's temple and, uh, and making offering for the people to God. It was their role and their duty and their responsibility to feed the flock, to declare unto them the word of God, his full counsel, to offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. Um, a great deal of the early part of the Old Testament is full of God's prescriptions and directions to the shepherds or to the priests about how they are to fulfill their responsibilities to God on behalf of the people. Day of Atonement, the Day of Jubilee, uh, you know, different feasts and offerings of sheep and goats and bulls and, and drink offerings and wave offerings, all of these things uh, prescribed by God to declare uh, to them how they should uh, feed, that is, nourish and protect the flock. And God here is saying, you have not done what you have called on you to do. You have fallen down on your duties. You eat the fat, and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. And God expands on that in the next few statements. 
by describing how the priests have taken it upon themselves to satisfy themselves, to nourish themselves at the expense of the flock. We go back and we read in the Old Testament, uh, the one that immediately comes to mind to me are the sons of Samuel, uh, not Samuel, the sons of Eli in the time of Samuel, right, uh, who were taking the, the best of the offerings and uh, keeping it for themselves and not even distributing it amongst the priesthood, if I understand correctly, and um, making the service of God a shame unto the people, uh, making it despised in their sight because uh, the offerings that they brought, they knew were being, um, uh, being skimmed, if you will, by the priesthood. And that happened repeatedly. God uh, calls out his shepherds, the priests, for such activity. The diseased, those that were uh, broken in spirit and in body and were come to the priesthood, come to the shepherds looking for help and guidance and, uh, and instruction and healing. They were despised and they were cast aside. Uh, the, those who uh, were driven away, nobody sought them. The, those uh, who were uh, despising the service of God because of the evil of the priesthood and the shepherds and walking away from the service of God, nobody went to seek them out and to draw them back in. So a, a host of things was wrong and it primarily rested with the priesthood. One of the things that we recognize in, in Scripture, not just in prophecy, but throughout Scripture, is that God calls to account those whom He has put in leadership over His people, and if they don't do uh, what he has called them to do, to feed the flock and to nourish them for him as he has called them, then they are going to have to answer to God. And here, that's what's going on. So the prophet is uh, relaying the word of God and declaring God's judgment on the priesthood. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. So God has expressed in, this, in these words now that he is finished with uh, the demanding of his priests what they ought to do. Now God is patient and long-suffering. And what Ezekiel through the Spirit of God has said here, is not the first, neither is it the only time that God has told His shepherds that they're not fulfilling their responsibilities and that His judgment is coming upon them. He will do this repeatedly, but now God is saying, I, this is over. I have given you your warning and you have not heeded me. So now God says, I will seek out my sheep. I will seek out my flock. I will go search for them. And he continues by saying, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. In those days of darkness, of trial and travail, when the sheep have been scattered, when they that are broken cannot find a uh, uh, a place to be bound up, those that are sick cannot find healing in, in spirit, when those that are uh, lost are wandering on the hills, God says, in that time, when my shepherds have failed, I will go after my sheep. I will search after them. These words should sound familiar to us because the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in what John recorded for us of his teachings, calls himself the good shepherd who goes after the sheep goes in and out before them, leading them in and out of the fold. Psalm 23 is another place that's familiar to us, where David, by the Spirit, uh, recalls, The Lord is my shepherd. You know, uh, I shall have no want. 
in his presence. He leads me beside the green pastures and the still waters and makes me to lie down. So this image of God being the shepherd is the example and the ideal for every one of the shepherds that serve God's people that provide for their flock. We look to God on how to effectively and appropriately and in harmony with his commandments feed the flock. God says to the shepherds then, because you aren't doing it, I will do it. I will go seek them out. Wherever they are, on the high hills, uh, wherever they're wandering, I will deliver them out of all those places. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. He continues here, but what struck me about this passage is how, again, similar it is to what Jesus said in his day and what else we find in Old Testament scripture and in prophecy. Many instances where God prophesies that he will bring his people back. Gather them from wherever they are. In one sense, we understand, especially because Ezekiel is prophesying from Babylon, uh, that God is prophesying beforehand that his people will return to Israel. That he will go find them amongst all the people, all the nations where they are scattered, and bring them back again to Jerusalem. But in another sense, as we read through this and begin to read the prophecy about the, uh, the, the shepherd that is coming, we understand also that there is a, a, a way in which these things are fulfilled in those uh, final days of God's creation when all of his people, wherever they are, by whatever name they are called, from amongst every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, will be gathered together to live in the most heavenly place in, in God's perfect and ideal kingdom, heaven. He will gather everyone from the oceans, from the land, from the air, wherever they, are, wherever they have been scattered, they will be gathered to dwell with God in his place, in his land. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. He is the shepherd. He is the, uh, the one who leads and guides and directs his children taking them to those places of still waters where they can find rest and peace, taking them to those green pastures where they can be nourished and fed upon the word of God. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. In that one statement, God proposes the opposite of all that the shepherds were doing. They were destroying the, the weak. And uh, God says here, I will, um, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. There, earlier on in here, God says, you shepherds, you've driven away all of these, my people. I will go find them and bring them back. You have failed to bind up what was broken. God says, I'll bind it up. You uh, will strengthen that which was sick. You have failed to provide healing and comfort to those that were sick. I'll do it because it is necessary to be done. And if you won't do it, I'll do it. Uh, I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them with judgment. So these shepherds are being called to account. And God not only is declaring what you haven't been doing, I will do, but also uh, you, you are going to experience my displeasure and anger and wrath because you have not done as I have called you to do. You will be fed with judgment, while my people will be cared for and nourished by my hand. And as for you, O oh my flock, ah, now we get down one more level. And as for you, O oh my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats, seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures? 
and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you, mo but you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Now the judgment has come down to God's people and the flock. God says, not only do I call to account the shepherds whom I have placed in charge over my flock, but my flock, those of you who have, uh, have done the same types of things, nourished yourself at the expense of the flock, your brethren. Those of you who have drunk of the deep waters and been refreshed, but fouled and made filthy those things for the rest of my people, you don't escape either. So what we learn here is that God not only calls his priesthood and those that serve his people uh, to uh, be obedient to him and otherwise to experience judgment, but also there is a very uh, plain sense in which God says to each and every one of his sheep, all of us, that we bear responsibility for maintaining the, uh, our own obedience and not to make the service of God seem uh, unpleasant or uh, not worthwhile to our brethren. We can do those things as well. Be lifted up in pride or uh, selfishness and make sure that we get what we need, but instead uh, those that uh, truly uh, may be in need are cast aside. We also are at odds here with God when we are doing the same things that the shepherds, the priesthood, are guilty of. It, it, so it goes from top to bottom. God expects certain, um, added, certain attitudes and certain obedience from all of his people. Not just the shepherds, but the sheep too. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder, and pushed all the diseased with your horns, till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. So God also passes judgment and calls to account his people, for uh, walking in pride and walking in selfishness and walking in greed so that the, uh, the rest of the flock or so that others of God's people find it to be, dis, uh, to be dishonorable to serve God, wondering what worth is it or what good is it if this is the way that God's people behave. Now, there's a certain instance, and I want to make this quite plain. There's, there is a, a certain instance where... Uh, Suffering for righteousness' sake is the lot of God's people. We will do right, but those evil outside will still proclaim that we don't satisfy their perceptions of what a Christian ought to be, and therefore we are not Christians. I'll tell you who sets the standard. The God who wrote this book. So if we abide by these words, by the words of God, no matter what someone says, if we in humbleness of heart and with prayer approach the service of God to uh, seek to be in harmony with he, what he has called us to do, doing righteousness and suffering for it will be our state. What God is talking about here is those amongst his sheep, amongst his flock, who have walked contrary in pride and selfishness and greed. He says, I will save my flock. They will be no more prey. I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them. Now we get to it. The shepherds that God put in charge over his flock, they have not fulfilled their responsibilities, and they're being called to account. And God has says, all of those things that you should have been doing that you weren't doing, I will do them, and you will face judgment. And then to the flock, the cattle, he says, I even judge amongst you. And those of you lifted up in pride with greed, walking in selfishness, you also will face judgment. And I will make sure that those of my flock who are in need, who are sick, who are broken, who are lost, that they are found, that they are bound up, that they are healed. 
and I will set up one shepherd. God had established from beforehand that there would be one to fulfill his covenant, to be the shepherd that he uh, was calling these shepherds, plural, to walk after, that there would be one to come who would, be, uh, who would uh, feed the sheep. I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. But wait a minute. How can David be the shepherd? By the time Ezekiel has written, David's been dead for quite a few years. How can it be that God's servant David can be this one talked about here? Certainly God's not a liar, so who could he be talking about? He must be talking about someone who is from David's line, who fulfills the uh, description and the promises and the prophecies of the one who is to come, who is called his servant David, which is that one who fulfills everything that David typified. We're talking about somebody else. Can't physically be David. He's dead. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Now, why is that important? Sheep, by nature, are timid, and, as I understand it, not particularly bright. So, having a shepherd to watch over the flock is necessary in order to keep the sheep safe, because otherwise they'll wander off. And, and just as God describes here, in a way uh, both natural and spiritual, they will become prey. A shepherd is necessary to keep them together, to guide them, and to protect them. The idea that the sheep will be able to sleep in the wilderness safely, or to go be in the woods without fear, is unimaginable from a natural standpoint. But the one shepherd that is coming, the son of the, the, the servant David, his power and his might will be so strong and so full that he will bring peace even in the wilderness. Even in the woods shall the flock be able to rest in peace because his power extends that far. He is so great and so powerful and so mighty. I will make them and the places around about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessings. Now this is repeated, as I understand it, in the book of Malachi. We have been reading and studying through that book, and it is in the third chapter, the tenth verse, where God says, Bring unto me the sacrifices and the offerings that you ought to bring, and test and prove if I shall not open the windows of heaven and pour upon you blessings that you cannot contain. Showers of blessings in obedience to God and to His command. I will make them, that is His flock, and the places around about my hill a blessing and cause showers of blessings to come upon them in that great and final day. I think what we're talking about here is a time of perfection and a time of pure righteousness, a time of joy and sinlessness that we have not seen. This is a time, I believe, that is to come when the one shepherd will finally accomplish all that God has described of him. The day, this, his servant David will co finally come and reign in peace and in righteousness, in fullness. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that served themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid." There is coming a time when the sheep will be able to rest in peace and there will be no fear of any beasts ravaging among them and making them out of them a prey. The evil beasts will be destroyed. 
I look around today and I see a lot of evil and a lot of beastly men. I don't know, I don't believe that we're here yet. But there is coming a day. There is coming a day when the servant of David, the one shepherd that God will set up, will bring to pass all that he has promised. Every one of the covenant promises will be finally and completely fulfilled when the shepherd returns. And there will be peace in the land. And the evil beasts will be destroyed. The tree of the field shall yield her fruit. There will be abundance and peace. There will be prosperity. There will be growth. There will be nourishment. All of these things. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown. And they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and the, that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men. And I am your God, saith the Lord God. It's a comfort to know that we're not too far off on the wrong path, and especially when God pronounces the meaning of things that he has declared. So now we get to the end of this part of the prophecy and understand that the flock are men, God's people. I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. A plant of renown. We look back in Old Testament scripture and we can find instances repeatedly where Jesus Christ is referred to as a branch or as a plant out of dry ground, uh, the branch or, and a root. Uh, much of this imagery is used and applied to describe the Christ, the Messiah, who is coming. And uh, they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. So there is a time of peace a time of wellness, a time of health, and a time of strength that is coming when this uh, renowned plant, this one with a great name, a mighty name, Shiloh, Emmanuel, Jehovah our righteousness, the Prince of Peace, when he is coming and will bring to pass God's, uh, uh, the fulfillment of God's covenant. All of these things uh, are attributed to the servant David, to the root and to the branch, the one shepherd, to the Messiah, and they will no longer be consumed with hunger, neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. No longer attacked by the wicked because they are destroyed. No longer suffering hunger because there is fullness and abundance in the land. No longer a prey because all of those who would destroy them have been cast out. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. In the days following these prophecies from Ezekiel, God would extend His power, reach out His hand, and destroy those that had oppressed His people, and bring uh, His chosen into place to allow and decree that His people should return to the land. That was... Uh, Darius and, and others who would, who would pronounce that the Jews, the nation of Israel, shall be able to return to the land. But these types of things that God is speaking about here through Ezekiel are more perfect and more full and more uh, peaceful than we can possibly imagine or understand. There is a time to come when the full peace of God will be on display, when His power will be plain, and when His people will return to the most heavenly place and there find peace and healing and rest and nourishment. God says, the flock of my pasture, they are men, and I am their God. He does these things for love and out of grace and for the protection and the deliverance of His people. It does not leave them forsaken or alone, but in those times when there is a lack of service and servants, 
to provide for and to nourish his people, God himself steps into place. There was a time over 2,000 years ago when the people of God were desperately hungry, desperately needing nourishment, wondering where peace might be found, and the shepherd came. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came into the world, and he brought reconciliation and redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins. And there is a time to come when Every tear will be wiped away from every eye when there will no longer be hunger, when there will no longer be uh, attacks from the evil beasts, that is, wicked men, but there will be only peace to remain, righteousness and joy and light to remain, love and grace to fill every heart, a time when the hills of Zion will echo with the sounds of the songs of God's people singing for joy and for praise at the salvation that their God has bestowed upon them. That day is the day we look forward to. We are grateful for the blessings of our God and that the shepherd, the Lord Jehovah God, will never forsake his people and continue to watch over them and provide for the sheep of his pasture. We're grateful that he has called shepherds to serve his children, to nourish them and provide for them. And we pray that the shepherds whom God has called will have grace and strength in their day of trial so that they themselves might not be a castaway but should continue to walk in the path straight ahead and be able to nourish God's people in the way that He has called them to. We pray that all of us, the, shep the, the, the sheep of the flock, will continue to walk humbly before our God, to heed His words, and not to cast out or push aside those who are weak or those who are in need, but instead to gather them in so that they might enjoy the blessings of nourishment and peace that we all enjoy. Not to be lifted up in pride, but in humbleness to seek to serve our God, the greatest shepherd of all, and uh, provide what nourishment and help and comfort we can to God's little sheep who are out there wandering and lost. And God himself declares and proclaims that he watches over his flock continually and perpetually and has us in mind to the extent that there will one day be showers of blessings that we can't begin to comprehend, peace and righteousness beyond our understanding, and a shepherd to come who will bring all of these things to pass and will reign over God's kingdom, his servant David, and will reign forever because his priesthood will never have an end, and His kingdom will never have an end. That's what we are looking forward to. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Malachi 3.10, Test me and see if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. Look and see the goodness and the grace of God in all that He does for all of His people. And rejoice that no matter how many days we may have left, God watches over us and cares for us and is one day coming to take us all home, to live and to dwell with Him in a peace and in a joy and in abundance and in fullness that we can't even begin to comprehend. No wonder Paul would say, that the trials of this life are not worthy to be compared with the joy that awaits God's people. Paraphrasing a bit. There is greatness to come, and we look forward to that day. May it encourage and inspire and move us every day to look to God, to seek to do His will, and to uh, be unafraid and unashamed to walk upright in this world and look to God for nourishment and peace. Let us pray for His shepherds. Let us pray for one another. And let us look for that day when the one shepherd will come and these cares and concerns of life will no longer trouble us, but we will know joy and peace. May God bless us all until that day.